Kia ora kato, uh, nā mai hari mai. Greetings to you all and welcome to this month's EHF Live Investor Session. Edmund Hillary Fellowship, for those that don't know, is a collective of entrepreneurs and investor change makers who want to make an impact globally from Aotearoa, New Zealand. So these are informal investor interviews and are planned in a way that when you leave here after 60 minutes, you feel you know the investor fellows on a personal level and understand what their intentions are for New Zealand. So this month, as I was saying earlier to those that came in earlier, uh, we've got two for the price of one. Mike Mesa from Big Sky Health and Kevin Rose from True Ventures. They've got a unique relationship in that um, their stories have been intertwining. Uh, they've worked together and played together for over 20 years. So first of all, housekeeping, as I was saying before, we are recording the session. So if you don't want your beautiful faces um, to be uh, recorded, then put your avatars up, but I hope you do stay. And please stay muted until you have your hand up for a question. And we will do Q&A at the end of it. Um, or you can put your questions in the chat box and I'll harvest those out as we go along. But um, first up, let's um, meet our speakers. So uh, Mike, we'll start with you. If you just introduce yourself and then Kev, if you can introduce yourself and just tell us um, what you're currently doing professionally. Sure, kia ora all. Um, great to see you all. And I can't wait to um, see you in person. Um, I've, I've got my vaccines done. So um, the travel wheels are beginning to turn and hopefully we'll get over there soon. Um, so Mike Mazur, I am the CEO of Big Sky Health. We are a company, a distributed company all over the world. I happen to be in Big Sky, Montana. And our focus is to create um, digital health apps to increase um, longevity and health span in broad populations. Nice. Over to you, Kevin. Great. Can you all hear me okay? Great. Um, yeah, it's uh, nice to see all of you on video. Uh, my name is Kevin Rose. I'm a partner over at True Ventures. We are a uh, early stage venture capital firm, primarily based out of the Bay Area, but we have uh, employees uh, all over the place. Um, Germany, the UK, uh, Canada. Um, so we're pretty distributed as well. We have uh, around right around a $550 million US-based fund that we have licensed to invest all over the world. So uh, personally, I, I have some companies and I have one company in Germany and one company, two companies in France. Um, so it's really uh, where, where we find innovation that is the most exciting thing, like that we don't really consider ourselves. I mean, we are US-based investors. I'm in Portland, Oregon, but uh, we're always traveling around meeting entrepreneurs and trying to find kind of just like the next uh, founding team that we want to back. We're very, very, very early stage. So it can be pre-launch, just a back of a napkin kind of idea. Our typical check size is one to $3 million. Um, you know, we're investors in, in Mike's company um, and we like to take on a ton of risk. So every single deal that we do is uh, typically about 1% of our fund or a little bit less. So in some sense, we'd almost find uh, rather find the right founding team and have them take on a ton of risk fail and then back them a second time than them not take on enough risk. Uh, and for us, that's, uh, that's worked out quite well. We, so our focus is, um, well, my focus individual, every partner at our firm invests in, in different verticals. For me, my interests are health and wellness, um, also consumer internet, and then all things uh, blockchain, which is... Uh, a very obviously hot topic right now, but um, and confusing one. And there's a lot going on there, a lot to sift through because uh, there's some not so good projects, but there's also some world changing stuff that's being built at the same time. So uh, looking at a lot of different deals, a lot of Zoom calls and, and very excited to get out to New Zealand again uh, as soon as possible. It's been for me, I was there a little over, it's about a year and a half ago. Uh, I was out there with some friends visiting. So um, yes. I think the last time you and I were in New Zealand, Kevin, was for Adam's birthday. Yeah, um, that's right. Yeah, so it's same, same or no, wedding, same wedding, but it was like a three week thing and you were in one week and I was in a different week, so. Yeah, they, they split it up with the with friend, friend groups. Um, and just to plug True Ventures before we get kicked off is um, they were the first check to be written into my company. And um, we'll talk about the deep connection with True on my journey, um, I think, as we go through this story, but um, just a world-class team. Nice, that's good. Love it. Um, so as you can see, we've got a couple of heavy hitters here. So 
you've already just sort of mentioned a little bit about your connection to New Zealand that you've been here like for the, just before COVID kicked. But what is what's your connection to New Zealand and why did you join EHF? Um, I can I can start. Um, so um, my connection to New Zealand is, was really a profound time in my life. Um, I had been kind of going through the corporate ranks um, in my marketing and business development career, companies like Intel, Electronic Arts, also some startups. Um, but I found myself in 2011 um, in a job that was, you know, paying me really well and I really was miserable. Um, I, I won't name the company, but if you want to look at my resume, you could, the people were great. I just wasn't happy in my role. And um, I was kind of, you know, I was early 40s. I guess I was in the introspective part of my career and really wanting to have more purpose. Um, and uh, long story short is I left that corporate job to start a company. Uh, my first founding, uh, you know, founding stint at the ripe old age of 41, 42. And um, in three months, the, the project that I kicked off and got investor money around, um, I shuttered. Uh, it, was, it was a very quick start to failure. And it was really for a variety of reasons that I decided to shut it down. But I went back to my investors. I hadn't spent most of the money, uh, thankfully. And they said, well, we invested in you, not your idea, which we didn't even love, but we knew you'd figure something out. So go figure something out. And it was a you know, that was um, for me a really, um, it, it was awesome to have that support from these people that um, I had worked with in the past that trusted me with their money, but a lot of pressure. And I was in Silicon Valley at the time. And, you know, if, if for anyone who's in the tech scene, you read TechCrunch and you're, you know, you're, I'm 41 watching all these 23 year olds get $5 million, $10 million of funding. And it was just, I needed to cut the noise out and just get out of Dodge. And uh, one of my, investors, um, a gentleman by the name of Roger McNamee from Elevation Partners um, said, you need to get to New Zealand. That's my prescription. You need to go to Christchurch, don't have an itinerary and just get some space. And so I did that. I packed a backpack. I didn't have an itinerary. I flew to Christchurch. Um, I rented a van. Um, I drove around the South Island and I really didn't have the intention to figure out what I was going to do. I just needed a break from what I had just been through um, and, and really could get that white space. But um, in that, in that um, travel and in that white space, um, that's when the ideas began to flow. Without efforting them, they just came in. And what I figured out when I was out on the Milford track is that what I really loved and what inspired me was I was tracking my, my hike on my watch, I had a polar watch, checking my heart rate, and this was just when quantified self and Fitbit was becoming a thing. And I decided right then and there that I want to be in this movement around digital health. I love it personally. I want to help people be more healthy. And I love the technology that was going on. And uh, I came back to New Zealand after two weeks, um, really inspired. And, um, you know, within a month, I had a, a co-founder, a technical co-founder. And we went on to start my first successful company, um, which was called Fitstar. But I credit it all to that that, um, you know, those beautiful moments of serenity and beauty that I found uh, traveling New Zealand without any itinerary other than just to get some quiet. Mm. Um, and so, so I, I, I feel like from then on, it was a marriage. Um, it was my second home, I guess, and at least in my soul. And so when the opportunity for EHF came up, mm. um, you know, it was, it was a no brainer to, um, to apply, let alone get in. No, and we're privileged to have you, Mike, actually. And I'm glad you actually got to go around the South Island. It's That's what a lot of Kiwis are doing at the moment, obviously, exploring their own country. What about you, Kevin? What's brought you to EHF and to New Zealand? Yeah, it's a great question. I, a little over a decade ago, I was invited uh, during the, the middle of uh, Web 2.0 chaos that was happening. Um, I had started a social news site called Dig, and I was invited to give a talk uh, at, in Wellington and at a tech conference out there. And I was like, wow, this sounds amazing. I've never been to New Zealand, you know, seen the Google images, <laughs> like, I should go check it out and flew out um, with my head designer, Daniel Burka. We gave the talk, met a lot of really great people. Um, uh, same thing, took the little ferry over to South Island, rented a car, did a whole week of just driving around down through Christchurch and it ended up in Queenstown. And 
we were, we were on a real, we got the, like the crappiest car. Like it almost died on us several times, uh, in the middle of nowhere, but it was, it was just so beautiful and awesome. And I think part of the reason why I live in the Pacific Northwest here in the United States and up in Oregon is that I'm just drawn to nature. Like it is, it is just like, I love all things outdoors and hiking in the woods and, um, just the respect for the, uh, you, you know, in, indigenous tribes and also the land and the land that has actual rights and like just everything that, that is in that ecosystem that New Zealand brings to the table, um, is such a very powerful thing to be preserved. And I've always just been drawn to that type of structure. And it's a bummer that, um, you know, we don't have more of that here in the States and, certainly uh, forest conservation and the things that are going on here uh, locally in Oregon, I think are, are really important to me because I want, I have two little girls, a, a three-year-old and a two-year-old, and I want them to be able to uh, grow up in that type of environment. So, um, you know, the second thing that brought me to New Zealand was that I, you know, I'd started a podcast called Foundation and it didn't have any ads on it. It wasn't a business. Um, it was just, um, to interview entrepreneurs and to really tease out their secrets and like what got them started. So I got really lucky to have, you know, the founders of Twitter on the show and I had Elon Musk on the show and like all these great guests that came on my podcast and with the entire goal of just inspiring other entrepreneurs and is getting them excited and letting them know that these are actual humans, like they're not, shouldn't be put up on some pedestal and that they've made a ton of mistakes themselves and actually admitting that they've made these mistakes and actually not beating themselves up about these mistakes, but just saying, I've learned something new and I'm going to carry this forward and become a better entrepreneur because of the mistakes I've made. These are the types of things that I was trying to get out in the show and in the podcast. And um, so I love helping founders. And when EHF came up, I'm like, okay, a land and a culture that I really respect, coupled with the fact that I can come in, invest in the local economy and help other entrepreneurs. Like those are all, that's like the perfect combination of things to come together. So uh, when I heard about EHF, it was really exciting. I have a couple other friends um, that are, are now in as well. And uh, yeah, it's just like, I couldn't ask for a better kind of like dream gig than to, to help out. Nice. And have you bumped into many Kiwis up in Oregon? Not, not really. You know, with COVID, we moved out here just a couple of years ago. And when, you know, we, we kind of like, you know, we have the little couple little ones, like I said, that three and two year olds. So I had a one year old and a two year old back then. And I was just like, it was all hands on deck. And then COVID broke out and we were just in lockdown and haven't seen anybody. So actually I was talking to my wife about this a couple of nights ago. We were like, okay, when all this like loosens up here, hopefully in the next few months, like let's make some friends. Like we need to make friends because yeah. it's just been like to toaster has been my best friend, my little labradoodle here for, for the last couple of years. I mean, I guess he's always been my best friend, but you know, not, not many humans. Yeah, no, that's good. That's cool. Um, Mike, now tell us about the special um, relationship that you guys have and how you guys first met. Sure. Yeah. I mean, when I, when I was thinking about this talk with Kevin, you know, there are a range of topics that we could talk about. Um, but one that I think, you know, I think can um, identify with all of us is, you know, we've all heard that axiom or a lot of us have, of, you know, don't, don't mix friendship and business. Um, I think my dad probably um, drilled that into me a little bit. And it just was like one of these taboo things. Like, you, you know, if you, if you become friends with the people you're in business with, and if you have to make tough decisions, it's hard on the friendship. And, and I think those things could all be true. But um, in the case of Kevin and I, um, and, you know, knowing each other for 20 years, it's, it's, it's turned out to be um, like a force multiplier for both like our friendship and the way that we've we've worked together. And I think, um, you know, I can deconstruct some hypotheses as to why, but in answer to your question, um, you know, that we first met in, in right around 2000, it was it was the height of the dot com 1.0 bubble. I was living in San Francisco. Um, I just left Intel on my first kind of corporate marketing gig, and I was um, a director of marketing for a company you've never heard of, um, but it was in the it was in the furnishings business, online distribution of furniture, which back then was novel. Um, I don't think you had gray I, hair back then either. You, yes, you were all, all brown hair actually. Thank, thank you for reminding me. I think hiring <laughs> you hiring you made me gray. Um, <laughs> um, I, I needed a marketing assistant and, um, I had a, an ad in Craigslist, which was the job board of the day back then. And, um, and, uh, Kevin, 
um, was living in Las Vegas, and I think you were 18 or 19 years old around or something like that. And you answered the, the ad. And so we hopped on the phone. I, I thought you were um, really impressive on the phone. Um, and I think I, I, I don't think I hired you sight unseen, but I think we flew you up to San Francisco. Yeah. It was and, my first time to San Francisco. That's right. Yep. Um, brought you up and, and then um, uh, hired him you know, shortly thereafter. And he moved to San Francisco and, uh, and he worked on my team. And that was really the first um, you know, connection that we had and, and started out as a working relationship. Yeah. And it was, it's crazy where it went from there because then Mike peeled off, he left. I started well, digging. Well, the you business went down to was doing really arts. badly just to, yeah. Was, and you bailed on me. Yeah, I did. I did. Yeah. So he bailed on me when he went to electronic arts was running some of their big, massive games. Uh, uh, what was it? Uh, game of Thrones or no, not game of Thrones. Uh, got, got you. Lord, on, of Lord of the Rings. Sorry. 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 Kevin. Very, sorry. You're running Lord of the Rings. And then, and then I started dig and I said, I need a fantastic marketer. Like I should probably hire Mike. <laughs> so I turn around and I hire Mike to come and work. I mean, technically you were, we were we, at that point we decided each other is like great friends and peers. And, you know, we collaborated on a lot of stuff product wise. And, um, you know, so that was, that was that venture. And, and then we've all been kind of intertwined ever since working on various projects and, and things together. Yeah. I think what's been, um, really neat is that I, I definitely took more of a corporate path, um, you know, going through, um, you know, functional areas like marketing and, and product development and, um, and business development. And Kevin's definitely been way more on the cutting edge, having a nose for trends, you know, seeing back in 2005 um, that, you know, that, that journalism definitely had a place, professional journalism, but that with the tools that were coming out online and online communities that, that the general populace could also have a role in surfacing and, um, you know, creating a wisdom of the crowds around, you know, what's popular and relevant to them. And that was the insight that led to dig. And I think, um, you know, what was interesting to me is I was at EA and I, I had been there for four years working on games, um, never got to travel to New Zealand, um, for the, for the license of the Lord of the Rings as the, as my team did, but I did get to go to the, the um, the premiere of Return of the King in Berlin with a lot of the actors. So I had a little bit of a connection there, but yeah, Kevin, um, you know, Kevin struck a chord with dig and, and, uh, it, it just took off almost overnight. Um, the traffic was incredible. And I think you saw in me, like, Hey, here's this person that I worked with, with more of a kind of a, um, a playbook on how to grow this thing, how to establish this business. And when you put that offer out to me, it was, you know, kind of the right time for me to move on and get back to San Francisco and, um, you know, get back into a, a startup that was really um, changing the world. And we were talked at in those days in the same breath as Twitter and, and Facebook. Um, you know, it was, a, it was an incredible time, but um, things went a direction that we didn't anticipate. We went through um, you know, we went through that, uh, um, layoffs together you know, and all kinds of stuff. A launch yeah. acquisition. Um, you want to talk about that moment where we were, we're riding high and then the bottom dropped out. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we, so it, it did, you know, we, we got up to 38 million monthly unique visitors that are kind of peak. And, um, you know, we thought Reddit was, was just over with, cause they had sold the Condé Nast for $10 million. Their traffic was like next to nothing. Uh, but the insight that they had that was so brilliant is they said, okay, well, let's go ahead and open up our taxonomy to be more of a long tail so that anyone can create a sub-community rather than just a fixed, you know, like we had like 15 different topics and so did they at the time. Uh, but then they opened it up and, and that allowed, uh, you know, there to be very small but powerful niche topics, you know, that would, would spring up and then eventually grow to be very large kind of uh, topics that that were the long tail. So that eventually, uh, and by that time we were very much our investors and everyone were, were pushing us to be more of a, uh, I won't say corporate entity, but really t take on more traditional advertisers that weren't as comfortable with some of the, the front page news that the community was surfacing. Whereas Reddit said, okay, well, let's just kind of like have uh, community advertisers and, you know, they didn't care about the general motors and like the big brands like that, they were like more kind of grassroots effort type advertisers and they kept their team really small and we grew a team pretty uh, too large. Uh, so a lot of mistakes, a lot of lessons learned. And, um, 
they eventually overtook us on on traffic and we were unable to to really gain that back gain that momentum back um so mike and i moved on um i moved that's on more of the investing well. that was so yeah, when you... well post dig and you stayed there a little bit you left around the same time and started another thing yeah yeah so i had another company called revision three that uh ended up doing quite well and we sold that to the discovery channel and then i had started a couple other little startups uh, one of them was acquired by Google, and then I was at Google. Uh, long, long, this is a long-winded uh, answer to your question, but um, that's eventually what got me back into investing as I was a partner over at Google Ventures, and that got me back into being a full, full-time investor. That's great. Loving it. Any other little tidbits you want to add in on that, on your theme, or you want to now get on to talking about your um, investments that you like doing today? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think there's one more piece around the friendship part that can, um, you know, um, have unintended awesome consequences. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I went on to start this company, FitStar, as I mentioned, after AOL. This is, we're talking 2012. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a, it was a personalized um, video-based fitness app. Um, and it was um, doing really well in the app store. And, um, you know, people were really get. It, it was basically a modern version of P90X, if any of you used to use those old DVDs to work out. Um, based on the iPad, um, and a Michael Chow, who was, I think, on the phone here, was a big help in us getting it promoted at Apple. But as I was um, growing that business, it was going well. Um, in, in late 2014, um, I, um, we, we were, had great traction, and um, i begun to feel kind of um, physically not well. I, I was having what felt like a really long flu, almost felt like it was mono, but I kind of wrote it off as being just, you know, founder stress. And, you know, along with that time, um, Fitbit, um, who was just about to go IPO, um, approached us to buy the company. And um, it was, you know, an amazing um, uh, entree to, to the, for them to come to me and, and um, you know, make an offer that was really exciting. Um, and so right at that time, as I continued to physically not feel well at all, um, you know, I was jumping for joy at their, um, at their acquisition offer, but then about a week later, I was diagnosed with, um, what turned out to be stage four cancer. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was like this ultimate high combined with this, um, you know, personal, um, you know, very rough situation. Um, and I kind of had to navigate that. And so while I was working on the term sheet, uh, to sell the company to Fitbit, I was going through really rough chemotherapy. Um, and um, during that time, I discovered some early work by a gentleman by the name of Walter Longo, a uh, physician out of USC around the application of fasting um, to chemotherapy with the idea being that if you are in a, a fasted state for several days, um, your healthy cells go into kind of a protective mode um, called autophagy. Um, where they're kind of cleaning themselves out and removing um, uh, uh, parts of themselves or basically eating themselves of all the waste material. Um, and the chemotherapy peak can then better target the fast dividing cancer cells that don't have any kind of change in their replication when you're fasted. So I did um, five day fasts um, for all six rounds of my chemotherapy so a total of 30 days of fasting over about four months. And, um, you know, that here I am six years later, um, it turned out well, but that's what kicked me off into really thinking about um, looking into this intervention, not just from a lifestyle perspective, which had already been pretty well established for weight loss and mental clarity, um, but also for the more um, scientific benefits around metabolic health. Um, that's really the underpinning of cancer coronary disease, et cetera. And so Kevin, you know, came to visit me in the hospital. You know, he was there with me the whole time and saw not only me going through this experience, but also saw that I was fasting. And he, he's always curious himself. And he started to look into the same, um, the, the same science that I did. And even, I think you even met with Walter Longo or talked to him on the phone as you were yeah. beginning your curiosity. And so he was inspired by my story in this intervention that he was being introduced to and started an app, um, a very simple app um, called Zero that um, just was kind of a weekend project with our friend Daniel Burka um, and put it out into the world. So as I was recovering, 
and I was doing my, my Fitbit stint um, after they bought the company, um, Kevin was tinkering with this project and lo and behold, in 2018, when I left Fitbit and I was ready to do my next thing, which had to be around fasting, Kevin was in a mode where he was focused on true ventures that kept him busy. And uh, he handed the baton over to me and, you know, the rest is how I grew the company. So, um, a lot there to unpack, but, um, it just, you know, it, it was a lot of serendipity. And, um, the reason that we are here where we are is, um, really due to our, our friendship together. Mm. So you're kind of proving the point you can work together and be friends, right? Because I've heard that my whole life is that don't work with your friends, don't partner with your friends. <laughs> yeah, so it's great. Nice to see. So how about you take us down then each of the verticals that interest you the most and that you want to invest in here in New Zealand. And then we kind of move on to more interesting stuff for what else you want to do. And then we can go to Q&A. Sure. Kevin, do you want to kick off here? Sure. Yeah, Absolutely. I mean, for me, it's it's really sticking to the core of what what I what I know and what I invest in. Uh, a lot of that has to be uh, certainly around uh, mental health uh, and wellness and and um, and fitness and you know backing Mike and other similar apps. Um, I've done a guided journaling app called Jor, which gives you kind of like prompts to do da daily journaling, which is really good for mental health. Uh, certainly on more of the meditation side. Um, there's a project that I, I had built in that space that Mike is actually now running as well. So I that coupled with devices that really can kind of peer under the hood and look on, into what's going on in the body in real time, I think the feedback loops for uh, understanding our body are getting tighter and tighter, meaning you know we have things like the Aura Ring now, um, which I, I'm also an investor in, which is uh, something that uh, monitors your sleep and gives you that data. When you wake up in the morning, you can see, you know, the different stages of sleep, how well you slept and how that correlates with certain foods that you eat. Uh, you know, when you tie that with your Dexcom data, which is a continuous glucose monitor, like I can look on my wrist right now and tell you that actually my glucose is 72 right now. Actually, well, it just jumped while I refreshed it 75 right now which means that I have a little sensor that's pushed that's actually a probe that's inserted into my side that reports back my real-time blood sugar. And so that can make me help me make better dietary decisions, but that's just one of many different sensors that are going to become online here in the next few years. So as you can imagine, you know, it's, it seems a little odd to me that our Teslas know more information about what's going on in our, we know more about what our vehicles are doing and the pressure of our tires than we do our own human body. So mm -hmm. just the idea that you can um, see that dashboard of tools uh, and, and react to them and make better decisions, I think it's very important. So I'll be actively looking for kind of health and wellness companies in New Zealand that are, that are going after and tackling those big problems. Um, that's a big piece for me. I also believe that, you know, in the next decade, we all laughed and bought and sold and, you know, looked at blockchain and Bitcoin and some of these cryptocurrencies as just being like, oh, that's a, a funny little odd thing. And maybe I can make a little bit of money and I'll buy some now and maybe sell it a little bit later. And it was just like, you know, no one really took it that seriously, but it's very clear that a lot of these technologies are not fads and they are here to stay. And they're going to bring a level of transparency to everything, to supply chain, to medical records, to um, fractionalize uh, house ownership, like whatever it may be, there's going to be an application for that type of tech. It was a really very key innovation. And I think looking back on things, uh, they'll, we'll see this historically as a big turning point for, for how we measure transparency around all things. So I'm excited to see more startups in that space as well. Um, and certainly I believe uh, there is a lot that you can do to apply that, those types of technologies to uh, the different existing industries that already uh, are in New Zealand uh, as it stands, especially around um, uh, supply chain. Um, so that is, uh, these are areas where I find there are great entrepreneurs are all over the world working on interesting projects, but you kind of have to have somewhat of a network. And that's why I'm excited about EHF. I think I, to have that local network and get that exposure to what's going on locally is going to be so important. And then just like boots on the ground. Like I needed to be there doing coffees, meeting with people, having these conversations uh, and figuring out what's being built. So that that's what's um, kind of most exciting for me. And then of course, there's the consumer internet side. Those are 
those are dangerous kind of murky waters where when I look at what's being built on the social side, it's, it's, the data is pretty clear that a lot of it's damaging, you know, whether it be fake news propagation or just time spent on devices. So I'm, I'm a little bit more cautious when I think about making investments in that space. And, and the good news is that I'm seeing a lot of entrepreneurs that are saying, okay, we can do better. Like what are some of the, 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 the safety and kind of like, um, uh, what, what tools can we reinvent in that space that give us, uh, you know, that, that safety net and just really make sure that we're doing this in a thoughtful way versus just building the best algorithm to suck in your time. So that you're spending less time with your family. <laughs> like those, we don't need more of those tools. Like those, we have plenty of those. So, um, yeah, those are the, my main areas of focus. And, and I think the earlier, the better, like I, 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 it's not about for us, at least it true. We're not about very late stage companies. Um, not to say that we can't kind of fund those once we've already made our initial investment, um, meaning that like, we like to follow a company throughout its entire life cycle. So, you know, we were very early stage investors in, you know, health companies like Peloton and Fitbit, and, uh, we'll write that very early check. So that one to $3 million check. And then as they graduate to later stages, like a series B, C, D, and beyond, we'll continue to write um, checks into that company to support them along the way. But, um, but we won't just like seek out later stage companies. If that makes sense. We have to like, you know, get in early and, and make our uh, initial investment in the very early stages. Yeah, that's nice. It's actually good to know because um, in New Zealand, there's not very many players that go in early stage when it comes to health. They prefer to go later once all the hard work's done. So that's really good. Uh, Mike, what about your venture? What, what, what sort of subsectors are interesting for you? Yeah, um, I mean, some are um, consistent with Kevin, um, you know, because we've, we've worked together and shared these interests. So we've co-invested um, in, in a handful of things together as well. Cool. We have. Yeah. And, you know, my so there's there's a space that I know that I'm interested in and there's a space that I want to get into. So mm -hmm. um, the space that I know is really what I call anything under the umbrella of metabolic health. Um, you know, metabolic health is really the, um, the staving off of the markers of, of metabolic syndrome, which I mentioned earlier, are the kind of the underpinnings of disease in Western culture. So um, we've learned over the last five or 10 years that, that things like elevated blood glucose, um, things like high blood pressure, um, but things that are lifestyle um, choices, um, sleep, stress, modalities of different kinds of exercise, um, what type of food you intake, and also when you're not intaking food, the fasting versus feeding window, um, all of these lifestyle um, um, you know, interventions can coalesce to make you metabolically healthy, or the inverse is metabolic syndrome. In the US, 88% of people are considered to have some type of metabolic syndrome, some marker of metabolic syndrome. And so I'm in. I'm in, interested in companies that are tackling this. Maybe not directly at metabolic health, but you know, companies that are focused on you know um, de-stressing, whether it's less screen time, meditation, um, better sleep, um, you know, promoting um, different modalities of exercise. Um, I'm an investor in a company called Tonal, um, which is the strength training peer of Peloton, um, and of course, I've had my own my own exercise venture. So things that promote um, uh, technologies and insights around exercise. And then of course, um, you know, things that can, that can help uh, people understand what they're putting into their body, how foods affect um, their health and their metabolic syndrome. So um, that's a general area I'm very excited about. Um, I, I am also excited about um, the biometrics that are becoming more and more available with um, new hardware. Um, so things like continuous glucose monitoring, um, breath-based ketone analyzers, um, lactate, all of these markers that can begin to give people a sense of what's happening inside their body. Um, that's a, that's a, a thematic area that both from an investor standpoint, also advisory and mentorship there. It's an area I've got a lot of experience in. I've been CEOing in this realm for 10 years. And um, I think there's a lot of different ways that I can help um, entrepreneurs on the funding side and also how to think about um, you know, growing their company, establishing their, their story arc, et cetera. Um, an area that, I, that I'm really keen to get into that I haven't made a lot of investments in 
Um, and this comes back to being boots on the ground. As Kevin said, I want to get there. Um, I want to, to meet people, um, but really around climate. Um, I feel like New Zealand um, is such a pioneer in so many ways around um, climate advocacy, um, around the way um, society is set up to promote um, climate care. Um, you know, I'll challenge Kevin um, to figure out how can we figure out a way to have crypto um, not have a direct impact on energy consumption and perhaps mm -hmm. um, climate impacts. Um, and um, just that, that general area to me is something, you know, as I, as I get into my 50s, um, and, I, and I also love nature and the outdoors is what drew, drew me to New Zealand. How can we start to protect it at, at scale and, and being involved in the ground level of companies that are doing that? Um, so that's something I'm really keen to dig into when I'm, when I'm there um, with New Zealand's leadership uh, state in that capacity. Um, I think those are the, the big areas for me. But again, mentorship is a big piece. Um, you know, helping companies get from zero to one. Um, it's what I do a lot of now. I'm an advisor to several companies, um, and I just want to do that, um, you know, across the pond in New Zealand. Nice. Love it. We can't wait to have you here. So if any of you in this room here can get these fellows in the room, I love it. We need them in the country. So pull all um, uh, strings that you've got and uh, get all that clout out of your back pocket and tell those uh, ministers to open up those borders. <laughs> right. We're going to go to Q&A now. Uh, who has got any questions? You can either put your hand up and I will get, or you can put your questions in the um, in the chat window. I've got one first though. What, um, just while I'm waiting for others, is are there, what, so you sort of talked about you want to get into the kind of uh, blockchain and, and sort of environmental type part. What else is there as fellows you want to do that's not on the investment side? Like what other sort of um, activities then you might want to do in New Zealand? I want to, well, there's I mean, definitely <laughs> personally, the first thing I'm going to do is go to the North Island because <gasps> I've been, every, I've been in New Zealand six times and I've never been to the North Island. And so like, that's my number one. I'm going to fly into Auckland and I'm not going to connect to Queenstown. I'm going to stay in the North Island and, and, um, and go visit. That's the very first thing on my list. Yeah. That's very unusual. Kev? <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's, I, you know, I was, um, I was talking with Yosef about this. I, I was asking him if there was any, like a big, a big uh, part of what I, I kind of on the nonprofit side that I, I try to contribute to um, is actually uh, an important part of my life is, is my meditation practice, specifically around a, a type of practice called Sambo Zen, which is a lineage of, of Zen meditation. Uh, it's like a non-religious, non-denominational, like very peaceful, awesome Zen practice. And um, I, I would like to see... Um, I was asking him like, what, what major cities have like any Zen representation and, and where can I go to help support that? And, and cause I would uh, like to see more mindfulness. I mean, it doesn't have to be Zen. It can be, uh, there's different disciplines of obviously so many different disciplines of meditation that are helpful, but uh, I would love to figure out in a more philanthropic way, how I can support and help grow that in the, in the New Zealand community. Mm. Nice. I like that. It's funny actually you mentioned that. Naraj and uh, Jack, other fellows that we've got, they run a like a retreat kind of thing over five days. I'm not sure if either of you two have done it, but there's like 126 types of meditation. Activeness can actually be meditation as well. So, which is really good for me because I hate it at the end of yoga where everyone's lying down sleeping. I cannot do that. That's not my form of meditation. I've got a question here, actually. Um, any reflections on the deals that you've um, seen to date via EHF, like the quality of the investments, um, traction? Um, is New Zealand on par with what you've seen in the US? Um, you know, I'd love to be able to answer that. I think I'm working at somewhat of a disadvantage, just not having to, to be on the ground. And, um, you know, for me personally, the way I'm getting my, my feet wet in the ecosystem is um, through funds to start with. Um, so I'm, I've, I'm in the Ice House funds um, just to start to get some exposure, get a lay of the land. Nice. Um, you know, Kevin, maybe you've looked at certain deals, but I know that for my, for me personally, um, you know, I, I we can do a lot on Zoom, but um, you know, again, it's the plug to get there and, and start to meet with companies face to face. Yeah, I think Mike's spot on. I did the same thing. I'm investing in Ice House Ventures as well. 
Um, and it's the same thing we do here in the States. Like, you know, I'm, I'm, they call them like LPs, like investors in, in other venture funds. And I probably do a good, you know, half dozen investments in these other funds, both to support the funds and also to get the connections and meet other entrepreneurs. Cause exactly. they're, they're meeting companies at the very early stage where they say, you know, in a perfect world, someone like an ice house or a, another fund in New Zealand would say, Hey, we have this company. They have about half of their round filled out, but they need some additional capital would you be interested in writing a check here as well? And so like just those, those warm introductions to those founders through a lens that you can trust goes a long way. And then those are the, those will always be the meetings that I, I'd take and see if it's the right fit for us and hopefully follow on and fill out the rest of the round. Mm, that's really interesting. Cause we were talking about that Mark Brigham and I actually either yesterday or the day before about are the U S investors going to keep doing the remote, doing the deals, over Zoom, or is it still going to revert back to how we were before and doing it in person? And what percentage, you know, how what's the likely uptake of maybe 20% still staying doing over Zoom, or is it going to revert back to exactly how we were? So um, that kind of, yeah, you want to I would say it's a great question. I don't think we know the answer to that yet. Yeah. I, I think there's yeah. a, I think it's a mixture. You know, I, I, I would, outdoor coffees are now, I'm seeing more of them happening. So that's, that's a good sign as people are getting vaccinated. Um, but, uh, you know, the nice thing to know is that we can do and close deals over zoom. Like that was a weird thing to do just a year ago. Like, you know, it was, I remember when we were talking as a fund, we're like, can we get enough of a, a gut check on who this person is and really get to know someone over a video, a, the, a strong enough conviction to where we'll write a multi-million dollar check. And like, since then, you know, gosh, we've, we've deployed at least a couple hundred million dollars since then. And, and it's been uh, all over zoom. So that the, the good news is we can do it over zoom, preferably face to face though. I still like getting together and grabbing a coffee and hanging out. And there's nothing like that kind of both bonding and brainstorming that happens, that riffing that happens. It's just like more real time. There's something about even just like a few few extra, like a quarter of a second delay that doesn't afford that. So yeah, yeah I'm excited for the face-to-face. -face. Yeah, and I think because everyone has been locked up, they're hungry for that face-to-face. -face. So they're oh, instantly cut off the, um, no, let's keep to the Zoom. Yeah, but maybe then in a year or two's time when efficiency thoughts come back into it, people might switch a little bit back, but yeah how it works out who knows but Mike there's a question here for you in the chat um actually it's for both of you is Brian has his you... hand raised as well too I think we have a hand raised for the oh, next cool. one Brian do you want to actually yeah ask you a sure question? yeah yeah no this is great to hear about all this work and uh after a couple of days in Silicon decades in Silicon Valley we're uh, at a field location here in Australia but um you know we're building founding teams, and I'm really interested in both of your perspectives on what makes for an outstanding founding team, and what do you look for? You know, how do we? What it seems like that's one of the most important ingredients in um, building these new organizations and new new efforts. And I'm just curious what your perspective is on this. Yeah, I mean, um, usually what's worked for me that, that's been tried and true is, um, you know, typically my founding team is people that I've worked with before um, that I have, you know, there, there's de-risking that relationship, that chemistry, understanding how they handle stress. Um, you know, to me, um, all it's being equal, that's been kind of the number one um, indicator of, of a fit and of success. But of course, you can't always do that. And so, um, you know, what, what we did, what I did at, at Big Sky Health, which was really new for me because we started as a remote first company, distributed first. We never had an office and still don't. Um, what I did was um, a lot of um, kind of mutual try before you buy. So um, I think my first five hires, what, what ultimately became hires, um, were co full time contractors. And it was, um, you know, we were both taking it a little bit of a gamble. And so this was a way for us to take some of the pressure off, um, see how we work together. Um, and we had established up front, like if it works well, and we, we were both going in intending this to move to full time. So you have to both be on the same page that you want to, to graduate to full time. But we already had like what the package would look like. So we kind of pre-negotiated a lot of these things, but um, we, I hired all five of those first people like there I was batting a thousand or that's a U.S. baseball reference but um you know 
a, a total hit rate on um, on hiring those people, and um, that's a model that we continue to use. Um, it doesn't work for everyone. Like it's really hard to get like a a COO or some you know VP of product to come in and do that because you're usually trying to you know pull them out of another gig. Um, but that's how it worked for for me in this latest venture. Yeah, we've yeah, had good it. luck with that ourselves at Climate Foundation. Just um, you know, basically, uh, kelp forest volunteers eventually becoming uh, part-time contractors and then full-time. So onboarding that's been a gradual process. It's just worked pretty well for us. But you know, we're really looking at how to transition from what has been development mode to you know, transformative products in the health space and and uh, ultimately in the climate space. But um, over to you, Kevin. Yeah. Well, thanks for your question. I, I think a couple. Uh, Quick things there, uh, you know, in terms of the the founding teams and what we're looking for, um, certainly original thinking, novel ideas, not just me too ideas. Like it's very, very uh, common for a, some type of theme to appear, and especially in the technology space. And then there's a bunch of just you know small iterations, but not really big leaps, order of magnitude leaps forward in thinking. And we want really big, bold novel uh, blue ocean ideas, meaning that, that we don't want a lot of other people in, in and around them. Like it's, it's nice that they're, you know, first to market uh, or have some insight that no one else does. Uh, and then in terms of the founder, um, you know, someone with a conviction and, and, and excitement around their idea, but beliefs that are, you know, both uh, strong, but, but loosely held, uh, you know, and I'm not the first investor to say this, like, like people that are um, open to taking in advice from others and, and flexible enough to be able to be nimble and, and change and, and modify and iterate. Um, so it's not like, I'm just going to, this is my idea. And if it doesn't work, I'm going to burn down the house to, to force it through. Um, I think is another important uh, piece of it. And then the, the, the last piece is just really uh, making sure you have a complete team uh, and and a team that is signed up to do this. You know, I have a founder today that I met with and she was seems to be a fantastic entrepreneur and she's just getting off the ground. She's got a great idea, um, but she doesn't have that technical co-founder. And so my job as an entrepreneur, well, as, first and foremost, as a fellow entrepreneur, not an investor, but I said, listen, like, you know, you can't go out and raise money like this today. Um, because you don't have the complete picture. You need like the other side of it. You need the other person that is going to be, uh, have the technical chops to be able to pull off your, your uh, fantastic vision. And so helping to pair her up with the right person um, to be able to go and execute on that vision is kind of what where I'm able to help out now, even though I can't help out right now on the, the financing side. But, but just having, and, and that doesn't mean you have to have someone signed up for your venture, but it does mean that, I'd like to see someone that said, this person will join me when we go and close this round of financing. So oftentimes I'll get a deck and it'll see the four founding people at the bottom and the entrepreneur will say, well, actually it's just me right now, but these three people are signed up the second I close this round of financing and look at their great pedigrees and they they want to jump on board and, and help me out. And, and we're okay with writing a check if that's the case. So the visionary, the technologist, what are the other key roles that you say that round out that team that form that completeness that you're talking about? Well, I think when you're talking about, a, it, it depends on the industry that you're going after, you know, obviously in the vertical you're going after, but when it's a technology play, um, you want to have the, there's the vision obviously is very important. And, and I, oftentimes the, the CEO founder is the Swiss army knife is the person wearing all the, all the hats initially. And that's totally fine. They could be the marketing person. They can be the, the HR person. They can do all those roles initially. Um, but that's not gonna, you know, I think it's, it's the, the, the technical stack needs to be figured out. Um, and, and the idea person needs to be there. So if you have those two roles, um, you know, you can contract design initially. I know Mike's done that very well, successfully a handful of times where he has a great idea, great technical team, but then goes and builds the first MVP through an outsourced design firm. And that's totally fine. Um, eventually, you know, you'll want to bring, bring someone like that in-house, but as long as the, the technical team is there and the vision and the, the visionary person is there, um, that's, that's all that we kind of look for uh, on, in a technology company. I mean, obviously if you're life sciences or other arenas where we want to see different types of folks. Sounds nice. great. Thank you. Love that. Co Melissa. Hey everyone. Um, I'm actually joining you guys from Singapore. 
Okay. Um, so it's very, very early in the morning. It's close to 7 a.m. here. Um, but I just had to join in. And I have to add that I'm just really not a morning person. I had to join in because there were so many things that were um, that I found really relevant. So I had applied to join EHF in uh, 2019 and I was shortlisted. Um, and I unfortunately had to turn that down because I was diagnosed with leukemia. Um, and that was also part of the reason why, oh, and the people at EHF were just so um, just gracious and nice about that. Uh, but that was the reason why um, we had to move to, to Singapore, which is where I'm originally um, from. So, so that was, you know, Mike, that was part of your story that, that got me really interested. Um, and then the second part of that was, um, is that I started a mental health startup just before, a few months before the diagnosis. So that was a bit of a bummer. That was actually my first reaction when I got the news. It was just like, oh, well, what about Bravely, which is what we're called. Um, and it's been one year since I got as close to one year since I got a stem cell transplant. Um, we're actually planning to launch our open beta on the 29th of April, which is the one year anniversary of it. Um, and, and Kevin, a lot of things that you said just really resonated with me um, in terms of what we're trying to build, what we're trying to do. We are still very early stage, um, fully remote team, which is something that I've been doing for 10 years. And yeah, we see that there's a huge, I don't even want to say gap. I mean, it's such a huge hole at this point, a huge void. Um, in the space and I've seen also a lot of people um, you know trying to replicate digital versions of what they find offline so have offline therapy now okay somebody's made something for online therapy but I've yet to see something that um, really fits digital really fits being smart being data driven that usage and a collection of that data and having that serve people so with your interest in the space, I guess, you know, you've talked a bit about what um, you would like to see, what companies you like to invest in. Um, and I think there's a lot of questions that you get asked is, you know, how can I get funding? How can I get your interest? I'm really curious, and I hope um, this is an okay question, about what you feel like you could bring to the table as an investor aside from, you know, the, the money side, obviously, um, but what, what would you be wanting to personally bring to the table in terms of, you know, the mental health space, um, helping these companies not just grow, but also fulfill the vision and the purpose that they've, they've set out to, which I believe is what a lot of these mental health startups just really care about more than anything else. Yeah. Well, Melissa, thank you for sharing your, your story with us and, and asking the question. I, I appreciate it. Um, I, I think that, you know, when you're, when you're actually working with an investor, um, it, it really is like a multi-year marriage because a good investor is going to stick with you through the whole roller coaster, and it's it's full of it's not just ups and downs, it's loop de loops and everything else that that comes <laughs> with with this ride. So um, uh, when you find the right investor, it, it's someone. Uh, it's funny because I've been on on your side of the equation where you're raising capital from a bunch of different people. Some of them you know better than others, and some capital is just that it's just capital, and you kind of don't hear from the person or they are overly anxious and maybe a little bit too much in, in your, in the weeds with you. And you're like, I just want to go run my business. Like, can you back off a tiny bit? So um, for me, I've always considered myself someone that is, that sits on the sidelines and that is the, the best champion for the entrepreneur and, and someone that you can just have a real conversation with. Like, I, I, I don't want to be the investor that you can't tell me something isn't working. And uh, because you know, you the, oftentimes the CEO doesn't really have anyone to talk to. They may have a significant other or something that they go to, but there's no one that they can really just say, today was a tough day. And I, I mm -hmm. haven't been able to hire this person. Like, and I lost a great candidate or, you know, I need to do some layoffs. And it's like, 
those are the types of conversations where you sit down and you can have a heart to heart with a good investor and they, uh, they, they're not judging you because they've either been there themselves uh, or, and they truly want to help out. Um, and on top of that, if you're finding someone that, you know, every investor is going to bring something different to the table. Like there's people that have worked like for Mike, for example, when you're, uh, doing, going for scale and uh, doing traditional marketing or going to, to build the brand on that side, like I would sit down and as an investor lean on him for that. Or if, you know, oftentimes my entrepreneurs, like I had someone that pinged me this morning and said, we're doing a design sprint with the firm. Would you be av available next week to sit in on that? Just like do a brain dump and a random brainstorming session with me, because I know you're passionate about the space that we're trying to build. And so hopefully um, you find a skill set that they provide that you're interested in. And that also matches their interest in your business so that it's a win-win that they're going to be able to, you'll be able to leverage them for that additional value. So you're right. It's not just about capital. It's about uh, capital and plus what they bring to the table in terms of what professional um, uh, kind of skill set that they can also apply to your business. Does, does that make sense? Did that answer your question at all, or am I still off? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it, it just sounds a lot like it's, it's about it being complementary, um, not just across like skill sets, but also I think a little bit temperament, a little bit of ways of working together, um, but most importantly values. Yeah, I, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll also chime in. First of all, Melissa, I hope you continue to be healthy and on the road to recovery. Um, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And, you know, I, from the other side, I'm being an operator, and I'm really more an operator than an investor, but I do, I, I do investing. Um, you know, it, it turned out that behind the scenes, the, the, the board members who supported that acquisition going through when I had active cancer was was true ventures they were on the board of fitbit and when i found that out i when i i said to myself if i ever start another company those are the people if they'll have me i want to work with and i want to take investment from because above and beyond their pattern recognition and sniffing out great deals and, and being very competent they have empathy right they're 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 people that to kevin's point you can open up and not have a fear that they're going to use that against you at some point that is truly an open relationship and they truly have your back and that's pretty rare um so you you know that's a, that's a hard thing to find but when you find it you know that's a lifelong relationship right there and something you should stick with and, and at least that's what I, i've stuck with no nice. awesome thank you so much thanks melissa Hey, okay. Melissa, do you have a, a website that we can check out i would love to it's a fantastic name i would love to check out the site Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, it's getbravely.com. So it's G-E-T bravely.com. Um, the website is slightly outdated. I did it between chemo rounds um, just before transplant, and it was developed while I was actually in transplant. Um, but I mean, sort of the key points are, are there and we're really just about... Um, trying to empower people with, with knowledge uh, wrapped with, with a smart interface that's just wrapped around that because the, the, one of the biggest issues with mental health is really about accessibility. Um, you know, what you have out there is inaccessible in terms of cost, but also it's dry, it's jargony, it's like so much easier to just sit and scroll on Reddit for two hours than, you know, pick up a, textbook for 15 minutes or be able to afford the therapy and we just really it's like somebody has said you know what you're you're struggling in in, in this deep dark ocean here's a ladder and you can climb up that ladder to get you know some help but then the top the top lung the top rungs are there but the bottom half of the ladder is missing and you're like well this letter is not really useful to me. And what we're trying to do is like to bring in that knowledge piece and help people with that bite-sized, like interactive content that, mm. that check in that smart tracking, um, and then just really feed you that relevant knowledge, helpful knowledge at a relevant, helpful time. Um, so you can find some of that on the website, just a little bit of a disclaimer, uh, not in the best state of mind when it, when it was created. <laughs> Oh, good. 
Thank you, Melissa. And I'll, I'll put, I'll send them the link as well. And it's great to see you as well. So early this morning. It's so good. Oh. Yeah, grab a cup Thank of coffee. You. Thank you for yeah. getting up for this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All that nice green tea, right? That's well, right. Time has gone so fast and it is time already. So I want to um, thank Kevin and Mike. It's been amazing. And, and Mike, we're so glad that you've got through that cancer scare and you are actually here with us and that you can actually hopefully come over the border and be with us in person very soon. So um, Room, I hope you have got to know these people a bit more personally and you now have a clear understanding of what they like to invest in as well. And next month, we're going to have Mark Bregman interviewing Ryan McIntyre. So thanks for joining us. And the recording will be up on the website and you can see all the other past recordings that we've had as well. And Kevin and Mike are here as fellows and they are accessible people. So if you need to send them deal flow or anything, you can either send it through to me and I can forward it on or you can contact them by their LinkedIn or Twitter or um, their individual um, sites that they've got. Thanks, team. Thanks, Thank everyone. you, Alan. That was awesome. Yeah. Thanks for showing up. Appreciate it.